So I was a preteen camping with my family on Galliano Island, and we had a rubber dinghy. Now this rubber dinghy was a symbol of my freedom, and I would often venture out um, away from my parents for the first time, especially with this sheltered lagoon where we were camping. The water was often calmer and, and okay for me as I grew up. I would go year after year to this lagoon. But this day, this day, I decided to take the rubber dinghy across the beach to the open-ended bay. This is a very unsheltered bay that had its opening to the Georgia Strait. So this day, I decided to grab the rubber dinghy, grab only one oar, because, hey, why not only grab one oar? I don't need both oars, and head off to the beach. As I got into the water, I made sure it was nice and inflated and, and got out, and the, the day was perfect. It was a nice, hot, and sunny day, and everything was going so, so well until all of a sudden, a southeasterly wind came up over the beach and towards me, pushing me out towards the sea. Now, it was, a, it was a sense that I had that just came over me that I realized all of a sudden that I was not in control. So as I started to feel a little more panic, I grabbed my one oar and I went side to side with this oar, trying to pull myself back to the beach but I couldn't. It made me a little nervous. I looked to the side of the bay, and, and as, I, as I looked to the side, I watched these sandstone sculptures of the waves that caved out, like caves. I watched these things pass by me as I was going out to sea. I tried to get to the rocks, and it just wouldn't be able to get closer to the side to be able to get out. As I was being pulled out, all I could remember feeling is there's two things that are going to happen. First, the, the number one thing is I'm probably going to drown, or worse, what'll happen is I'll be carried out to sea, and I'll have to be res rescued, being utterly embarrassed for all of what's going on. But as I got to the end of the bay, there's a couple people that were just sitting there on the rocks. And this lady was watching the whole thing go down, and, and she, she called out to me, and she said, are you okay? Do you need some help? I said, no, I don't need any help as I'm struggling away with my one plastic oar. Well, thankfully, she didn't stop there and just leave me. She didn't believe me, and she said, are you sure? Because I really think you could use some help. At that point, I had to surrender. I didn't have control over the boat, and I reached my, my plastic oar out, and she reached out to my plastic oar, and she pulled me in. Now, that was a very, very scary uh, a moment for me, and, and as a preteen, it was, it was horrifying, it was scary, because I didn't know what was going to happen next. But at a young age, I became very aware that in life, there's things that we can't control. There's things that are just not controllable, whether um, one of the things that happened to me was that my parents got divorced. That was something I couldn't control. I couldn't control that my one-day wife would marry me or not, or whether we would have kids or not. And even when you come to the more current things that are going on is this sense of loss that we feel during the pandemic. This sense of not being able to, to visit with our extended family over Christmas, as my extended family is very important to our family, and and, and beyond that, it's my daughter's birthday on Christmas Day, and we couldn't have the family together like we always have. You know, this is, this is hard. Life is hard. Some of us have experienced a weddings or funerals or a graduation during a pandemic, and it just, it's just this time that we're living in is really hard. Life can feel out of control sometimes, but I want to pose you this question. This question is this. Have you ever wondered if life was never meant to be in our control? Have you ever wondered if, if life was never meant to be in our control? What do I mean by that? Well, maybe, maybe we try to control things, control our lives while it's impossible to do so. And yet, and yet we keep trying to be sovereign over our lives. 
I wonder if a lot of our problems orbit around this dichotomy that we're stuck in. The struggle of trying to control what we were never meant to control. What if God was supposed to be in charge where we've claimed ownership? What if God is the owner and we steal minutes away from his purpose? Well, in the Bible story today, we're looking at Daniel chapter 2, 1 to 23. So in this context, we see a very restless and controlling Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar is the king and ruler of Babylon. You see it right away. This guy is a control freak. Like, he's a control freak. And this is not an overstatement, and you'll see why in the story. He thought he could control everything in his life. But this story about one of his dreams just wrecked him. It wrecked him. He is given the chance in this story to know the God, Yahweh, that is sovereign. Remember, though, that, that he, the ruler of Babylon, had conquered Israel and taken all the Israelites into exile into his country and expressed dominance over them and their God, as we've learned in this series. So before we go further, I'm going to continue in more of a recap of what's going on because it's a big part of the passage. So we're going to look at this, this storyline of Daniel 2, 1-23. So as the story goes about, Daniel's a young Israelite forced to getting trained as a dream expert. So trained just like the Babylonian astrologers. Daniel and his three friends, there's some promise with them. They're even claimed to be maybe about 10 times better than, than a lot of the other ones, but yet they're still young and still in this Babylonian university. Nebuchadnezzar then has this dream that troubled his mind and he couldn't sleep. He was very, very bothered by this dream. Now, he goes to these people that are probably the Babylonian professors of, of Daniel and his friends. He goes to them, and he asks them this. He says, tell me what my dream is, and then interpret it for me. Like, what? Like, why would you say that? Tell me what it is? Like, he hasn't spoken a word to these guys yet. He just goes up to them, and he says this. It'd be like saying this. It'd be like saying, hey, Pastor Brent, I had a dream last night, and I want you to tell me what it is, and then interpret it for me. I mean, that's just unheard of. I mean, unless there's, there's some way that, that Brent is this fictitious superhero with superpowers, it's not going to happen. I mean, Brent might want to be a superhero. We do know he is a, has a, an exciting passion for that. Or how about this? How about in the book The Hobbit? And Gollum is, is wondering what Bilbo has got in his pockets is. I mean, it's not possible for him to know. It was just not an, impossible, um, an impossible thing for him to know. So here's what the normal process of Babylonian dream interpretation looks like. Step one, you share with the experts what the dream is. Makes sense, doesn't it? And then step two, you get them to go away and then interpret it and then come back and tell you the interpretation. So why does Nebuchadnezzar not do it the normal way? Well, I think he's trying to see how legit these, these guys are, these experts that claim to be experts. He wants to make sure that he's got the truth on this dream. I, if they could tell his dream without him sharing it, he would know this was true. I think he's bothered and impatient because finally there's something he's not able to control. So let's read chapter 2, uh, 5 and 6 together. It says this, The king replied to the astrologers, This is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I will have you cut into pieces and your houses turned into piles of rubble. But if you tell me the dream and explain it, you will receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. So tell me the dream and interpret it for me. So he attempts to control the answer. 
he tells them how it's going to happen. This is what's going to happen. If you don't tell me, trouble is coming. But if you do tell me, I'm going to, I'm going to bless you for that. Because, hey, why wouldn't he try to control it? He is the king of Babylon. He has felt this power of being able to dominate another culture and another nation. But the dream experts couldn't interpret it. The dream experts responded to him with, no one has ever in the history of the world been, has asked anybody to do this. It's not humanly possible. So because they couldn't do this for him, he gets suspicious. He gets so suspicious, claiming that there must be a conspiracy here, that they're conspiring to not tell uh, the reason why he can't know, he, that they're not going to tell him. So let's read verse 11. It says this, What the king asks is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods, and they do not, they do not live among humans. Interesting. It's interesting that there's a difference between the gods. Because we all know that the one true God did come as a human, as a baby in a manger. What an interesting thing to note in this time of looking at Daniel. There is a God that lived among people, not like the Babylonian gods. There is a God that cannot be controlled, and that is okay. Nebuchadnezzar gets furious and he makes a law to kill all of the dream experts, all the astrologers, all the magicians, all the dream experts in Babylon, which includes Daniel and his three friends. So Arioch, the king's official, is, is told by Nebuchadnezzar to go out into all the land and to seek out all these people, including Daniel and his friends, and put them to death. So when he comes to Daniel, Daniel responds with this message and says, why? Why did the king do, say this? So we look at verses 15 and 16, which say this. He asked the king's officer, why did the king issue such a harsh decree? Arioch then explained the matter to Daniel. At this, Daniel went in to the king and asked for time so that he might interpret the dream for him. Now that's a bold move for Daniel, isn't it? It's a bold move. Could you imagine if Daniel went in and then tried and then failed? Like, there's a lot of great faith in Daniel. But Daniel knows his purpose. He, he knows his purpose in life is to glorify God. He knows who's in control of his life. He is confident in this. He has complete reliance on God. Now, I can't say for myself that in every situation, in every circumstance, in, in every part of my daily life that I've been relying on God. You know, sometimes, um, sometimes I doubt. Sometimes I'm not so sure about things, and often that's because I've taken control back into my hands and tried to do it myself. But what I need to do is I need to hand over the sovereignty of my life to God. So Daniel, back to the story, Daniel stuck his neck out, but not frivolously. Because he still returned to pray with his friends. I mean, if, he, if this doesn't work, if he prays and this doesn't work, he's dead. I guess he's dead either way. But he's dead. Daniel knew that there still is a purpose of prayer in this situation in the face of death. So funny enough, God did speak to Daniel in this prayer time. And in this, but, he, but what he does is that he prays, or he, he hears from God in a dream. And in the end, Daniel praises God for his complete sovereignty in the situation. He praises him before anything has actually happened with Nebuchadnezzar. So that's the story. So here are three things that I feel we can really bring out of the story that apply to us today. The first is this. We are not in control, and that's okay. We are not in control, and that's okay. And this is what we've learned from Nebuchadnezzar, didn't we? We are created as rulers. As human beings, we are created as rulers, subduing the earth right from the get-go in Genesis chapter 1. That's what we read. So we are given this opportunity, this, this sovereignty, kind of, this minor sovereignty. However, we are never alone. 
We're never alone, and we're also never in control outside of God's ultimate sovereignty. In our freedom, we have opportunity to choose things. But we get into trouble when we control things that are outside of our purpose. Here's an example or an analogy for you. You can imagine God as the macro manager and as rather than a micromanager. And I know this isn't a perfect example, but I think you'll get the idea. So God is that macro manager. What I mean is he, God gives us a playing field to play, to play in, to live in. So to give it a picture, we can think of it as a soccer field. So picture a soccer field in your mind. We can run back and forth. We can make plays. We can, we can go wherever we want inside those bounds of those, of, of those lines of the soccer field. But we're never allowed to, allowed to go outside of that. God doesn't dictate every footstep, every play. He doesn't micromanage our lives. He allows us to choose within his will for us. You know, sometimes we look at the other soccer fields, the other pitches, and we look at the turf that might be newer, and we think, oh, but I want to go play there. We think that our own rules of going outside the playing field is okay, or even better. But we all know what happens when we make up our own rules, don't we? It's chaos. When we make up our own rules, it's, it's not within the bounds of what God wants, and things always seem to happen. But God created us. And it is in his prerogative to create these set of boundaries for us. He has that authority. So whether Nebuchadnezzar knew it or not, he is an example of what it looks like to make up our own rules and the consequences that follow. We right now are not in control of our lives. Maybe we need to be more willing to reach out that plastic oar and ask for help because our life is drifting off to sea. And, whether we, and we, we probably know it, but we're not willing to admit it. If this is you, it is time to surrender to God. If you have felt a loss of control and you have nowhere else to go, it is time to surrender to God and his purpose and his desire for your life. If you have never surrendered to God, it is possible to right now. So if you felt recently like your life is out of control, I'll, I want to give you a solution to this problem. Surrender to God. Ask Jesus to lead you. Ask him to lead you. Jesus is God's son, sent to this world to pay for the wrongdoing that we've done. He willingly dies so that we can have eternal life. Trust in his arms to carry you by daily surrendering to him. Let go of control and let him guide you. I mean, you have nothing to lose by giving him a daily surrender of your life, but everything to gain. So if this is you and you would like God to take hold of your life and for him to lead you through life, I want you to pray something from your heart, this. To say to God, God, I know that I need you. I believe that you're real and that you died, that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die and rise again for my sin. I confess the things that I've done wrong and I ask for your forgiveness and I choose to follow you the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. And knowing that if you say this with your mouth and you believe it in your heart, you will be saved. You will give control over to God. You will give your, the control of your life to him to guide you, the creator of the universe to guide you in your life. And you can live free. You don't have to live for yourself anymore. You don't have to live for, the, for this, this problem with needing to control things that we can't control. So the second thing that we have in, that we can learn from the story is this. We can rely on God more than we are today. We can rely on God more. And this is some of the, the, two, the next two things are what we've learned from Daniel in this. So Daniel's a really good example of someone who's relying on God. He doesn't rely on his own strength, his own, his own learning from Babylonian University. He doesn't rely. Where did he go? Oh, he went to prayer. Daniel went to prayer. He knew and trusted that God would help. 
So how does Daniel get so good at this? How does he get so good at understanding that he has to go to prayer in this sort of situation? I want to share a quote from you, uh, for you from John Dalrymple. He says this, The truth is that we only learn to pray all the time, everywhere, after we have res- resolutely set up about praying some of the time, somewhere. See, Daniel was already living a life of prayer. That was his life. He didn't know any better. In and out of any of the storms that he experienced in life, he would always go to prayer because that's what he was doing. When things were hard, he went to to God in prayer. When things were great, he went to God in prayer. Are we confident enough in faith, like Daniel, to go to God that quickly? Do we have that built Have we put in that deposit of being people that go to God right away? Daniel knew God so well that he knew that what was humanly possible, but also what was not humanly possible. And this was something that he knew that God could come through for. It wasn't something he could do, but he knew God could do it. So Daniel could have trusted in that dream training. He could have trusted like like us in our own abilities or like our christian upbringing or maybe the the education from our christian school we can trust in those things but in the end it's not good enough that in the end he just like daniel we need to turn to god we need to rely on god more than we do today so daniel was so confident he thanks god in advance for that answered prayer One of my favorite authors, Richard Foster, says this. Simple prayer involves ordinary people bringing ordinary concerns to a loving and compassionate Father. So I want to encourage you with some words. God is always there for you. He is always there. He is your loving, heavenly Father. You can know God well in this way, just like Daniel. All of us can. Daniel's not an exception. We can all know God this way. Are you constantly in prayer? Are you gathering or are you involved involving God in your conscious thoughts and daily life? Because he's there with you, experiencing with you your daily life. So far, here's what we've learned. We've learned first thing is that we are not in control and that's okay. The second thing is that we can rely on God more. And the third thing is this. We need each other. That's it. We need each other. And Daniel knew this. Daniel knew that we need others in this life. And he also knew that when we come together with others, there's a heightened effectiveness in prayer when we gather with others. He knew that this situation wasn't something to be taken lightly. I mean, death was on the line. This was a big thing that required him to come together with other believers. That's why he went straight to his three friends. He knew that he could petition to God with this request. So do you have a safe place where you can go and be prayed for? Or how about let's, let's turn this around a little bit. Do you have a safe place where you can go and pray for others? I don't know, do you have that place? If we don't make ourselves available to others to pray for them, then we miss out on the blessing of being able to pray with people. I want to share another story with you. And this comes out of our community group. There's someone in our community group that, that is working in the, in the uh, healthcare sector. And it's been really hard during this, pandem- this pandemic to, to be working in this healthcare sector. And, and they asked on our WhatsApp group, they just said, can you just pray for strength and wisdom because I really need it right now. And almost immediately, all of these responses kept on coming in from all the different people in our community group just, and just saying like, yes, I'll definitely pray. I'm going to pray for you right now. All these things. And, and this person came away feeling encouraged. They were supported with, by the people that they're doing life with. You know, that's how the church can really function well. That's how we can really support each other. By praying together, by running to each other for prayer. We need community with a few. 
We need it. So do you have people to run to like Daniel did in this story? So today we're, we are reminded uh, who really is in control, didn't we? We're reminded that, that, that God is ultimately in control of all things over people that are Christian and people that are not. He is still in control. God is in control. We need to trust in him. And that what he's put in place, we still need to trust, even though we may not understand. In the midst of this life, we need to give that sovereignty to him and not to take it for ourselves. We must daily, hourly rely on him and trust him if we want to live a life that God intends for us. And we must do this together. To do this with others. We need to live our life with others. We need each other. We cannot do this alone. In fact, I don't know how I could do this alone. I couldn't do this alone. I need others to help me, to pray with me, to pray for So I'm inviting you to join me in this because I think I need this just as much as anybody else. I want to live a life that would be, that would rely on God more, that would give him the sovereignty and would be able to pray with others. And you know what? Jesus is inviting you to do this as well. So I encourage you to do this, to live for his kingdom, to live as Jesus is the king of his kingdom, who is sovereign and who is in control. So choose one of those things today. If there's anything you can get out of today, I hope that you just choose one of those things. That either you can give God the control in the first place, you can rely on him more, or, or create a place where you can go and pray and be prayed for by people. So take courage, take comfort, take your refuge in his strength. Join me as we pray together and surrender sovereignty to the one who is rightfully sovereign. Let's pray. God, you are a great and mighty God. Often we find ourselves trying to control our lives apart from you, and we must surrender and allow you to lead us. May we we rely on you and your goodness, and together we commit to praying for each other, and especially those who don't know you. Continue to speak to us, Lord, through the Daniel series, and it is through the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Well, thanks for listening to us today, to me today. I've already been praying for you that you would just fall deeper in a relationship with Jesus. That through this Daniel series, you will continue to pursue God more than you did yesterday. And as we said earlier, if there's things that you would like to know about our church, if you want to connect, you want how to give, find videos and other information about our church, go to southridgefellowship.ca. And that all being said... I can't wait to have you join us next week. It'll be great to have you attend our service and continue on in the Daniel series.